Okay, so welcome to the 12th um, HMI Data, AI and Society Seminar. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging. Um, today we've got Naman Goel, um, who's coming to us from Switzerland, um, from the uh, from ETH set there. Um, he completed his um, uh, PhD over there just this year. Congratulations, Naman. Um, and he's taking a postdoc there at the moment. Um, so Naman's going to be talking about data missingness and algorithm, algorithmic fairness. Um, so Naman, if you'd like to start, you can go ahead and um, share your screen and, yeah. and we'll get cracking. Okay, so do you see the full screen or do you just see also see next slide anything? Just seeing the full screen. Okay, okay, good. So thank you everyone for joining today, uh, this early hour. Uh, Australian time. So as that said, uh, I'm going to talk about the, this recent work, the importance of modeling data missingness in algorithmic fairness. And this is a still work under review, not yet public <clears throat> anywhere on archive. Uh, so this is joint work with my collaborators uh, from Microsoft, Amish Charma and Amit Deshpande, and Alfonso, who is a master's student at EPFL. So um, as we all know that algorithms uh, are being used now in, in many applications of societal importance like criminal justice, uh, hiring university admission, um, um, healthcare loan approvals, et cetera. And uh, since many of uh, these algorithms are data-driven, they can learn uh, pre-existing biases, social biases from the data. And when they are applied to take decisions for the future, they often take biased decisions. So this problem has received a lot of rec attention recently uh, with, with, from researchers uh, coming from different fields. Uh, people have come up with a lot of definitions for fairness, uh, what fairness means for, for algorithmic decision-making, and also techniques to satisfy those definitions uh, for different algorithms. So, um, so a common approach now for training for fair machine learning classifiers is, is something like this. Uh, so the first thing that we need to train a classifier, any classifier is obviously a big training data set uh, where different rows contain observed outcomes for different feature values, right? So for example, if you are training a classifier to <clears throat> let's say uh, take making loan decisions, then our data set may look something like this. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we see uh, different feature values uh, like prior cre credit history, salary, education, et cetera, for different individuals. And on the right-hand side, we see the outcome, the observed outcome, whether the respective individuals paid back the loan or not. Right. So this is our data set. Uh, then what we do is uh, uh, in the second step, we'll very carefully think and uh, decide on a, an appropriate fairness metric for that particular application. For example, it could be demographic parity or equality of opportunity. And uh, then we'll pick up a state of the art fair machine learning algorithm, and then we'll apply it on this data set to train a classifier with fairness constraints. Finally, we'll just deploy this trained classifier to make future decisions. So this is like the current approach of training fair machine learning classifiers. Uh, so this seems like a good approach, right? But are there any problems in this approach? Well, there is one big problem, uh, which is that there is no guarantee that this supposedly fair classifier that we just trained using uh, a state of the art machine learning classifier um, algorithm uh, will actually take fair decisions in the real world. And, and the reason for that is missingness in training data. So what do I mean by missingness in training data? So um, let's uh, consider two individuals who in the past applied for a loan uh, with a bank and they had these different features, let's say X1 and X2. The bank looked at the features of the both individuals and for the first individual, it approved the loan and for the second individual, the bank denied loan. So what will happen after some amount of time that you will observe the true outcome for the first individual, uh, whether this person paid back the loan or not. And this feature and outcome pair will become part of the training data set. Whereas for the other individual, true outcome was never observed. And so 
this feature and uh, uh, outcome pair goes completely missing from the tra training data. So if I, if I can summarize that slide in, in one line, is that training data, even if it contains objective ground truth outcome and infinitely many samples is often one-sided uh, due to some kind of systematic censoring by past decisions. So there are obviously other kinds of issues uh, in, in, in data that, that can cause bias. For example, you may not be able to measure the outcome sometimes. Uh, the, uh, the outcome may be subjective or it may not be, there may be some kind of errors in it. But what I'm just considering here is that very objective ground truth that you cannot observe correctly, but there is some kind of missingness in the training data. So you don't observe everything. You just observe partially some of the uh, records. So while most of the work in fairness literature ignores this problem, but there are some recent work that do consider this problem. I'm not going to go into the details of all the related work for now, but towards the end, if there is time, uh, time left, then I can probably go through it. Uh, I can just summarize that in this work, our focus is on general identifiability of distributions uh, from, uh, from missing data. And what does it imply for fair machine learning algorithms? So before we get started, let me also give a very quick introduction to causal graphs. So causal graphs are probabilistic graphical models that are used to encode assumptions about data generation process. So for example, if you want to represent the causal relationship between variables, gender, age, and obesity, then, and we assume that both gender and age have a causal relation with obesity, then we can use this causal graph to represent that relation, where edges represent the causal relation between variables. Now, when there is missingness in the training data, Kartika Mohan and Yuda Pearl uh, proposed this uh, elegant framework recently for uh, also representing the missingness mechanism through causal graphs. So assume that for the same example of gender, age, and obesity, uh, let's say we observe the age and gender completely for all individuals, but obesity has some missingness. So we don't observe obesity variable for every individual. Uh, so you can see in this obesity star, um, column where for some records you actually observe whether individual is obese or not, whereas for these two you have the missingness, uh, so you don't observe the correct uh, data. And then there is this separate uh, variable that we have added which we call as let's say missingness mechanism that represents whether you observe the true variable or not for obesity. So whenever this R, not, R subscript O is zero, you observe it, uh, you observe the obesity variable, and whenever this is one, you don't observe it. So you can think of it as some kind of on off switch. Uh, now, when we want to represent it in the causal graph, uh, we can use, uh, so the first part is the same, G, A, and O variable. Now we add this new variable, O star, which represents the variable that we actually observe. So it's the version of variable O, but we don't observe O, we observe O star. And O star is affected by this R not, uh, R subscript O variable, that is the missingness variable. And it's also uh, obviously affected by the original variable O. So the first case is what we call as uh, the missingness, missing completely at random case, uh, because in this case, R0 does not have any incoming edge from any of the other variables. So there is missingness in O, obesity variable, but it's completely at random. So this is the classical uh, terminology for in statistics for missingness in data, uh, missing completely at random. And then the other case is let's say missing at random in which uh, the R0 variable has an incoming edge from one of the other observed variables, let's say A. So people of a certain age uh, try not to report their obesity, let's say. So age causes indirectly uh, missingness in the variable obesity. Now there is this final case missing not at random where 
R naught has an incoming A edge from variable O itself. So in this case, uh, the variable itself is causing its own missingness. So people who are, let's say, have a certain obesity level, they tend not to report their uh, uh, data. So this is the case of missing not at random where the variable itself causes its missingness. So there is some notation here that I'll be using in the rest of the talk. So X I'll use to denote non-sensitive features of individuals that uh, observable non-sensitive features. Uh, Z is the sensitive attribute of individual. D is the past binary decision that we say is affecting the missingness in the training data. Uh, y is the true outcome that we observe after some time, whether, for example, somebody paid back the loan or not. And U is um, using it to denote unobserved features. So unobservable features are features, let's say, that are not in the training data set. But for example, a human may have used those features while making decisions, but they are not part of the data set. So for example, if a person came uh, for an interview uh, with the human, then the human may have observed how this person was dressed, what, uh, what was his hairstyle, et cetera. But you know, these things are not in the training data set, but they may have affected uh, the decision, past decision. And why hat is, uh, is going to denote class classifiers prediction that we are going to train on this missing data and incomplete data. So again, there are lots of fairness definitions in literature, but I'm just going to focus here, for example, on demographic parity and equality of opportunity. So demographic parity re requires that the probability of classifier giving a positive decision is independent of the sensitive attribute of the individual. And equality of opportunity requires that the probability of the classifier giving a positive decision is independent of the race or the sensitive attribute, uh, given that the true outcome is also positive. So, so now let's say we are interested in training a classifier that satisfies these EOP constraints. Uh, and, and many algorithms actually require uh, while training uh, these fair classifiers to estimate uh, these EOP constraints from the training data. So how do we do it? So consider this uh, simple graph where X are the non-sensitive features as I explained. And they are, let's say, affecting uh, the true outcome. And then there is a variable Z, the sensitive attribute that is affecting, uh, let's say, the features. And these are, by the way, causal graphs are just examples here. I know that the causal graphs can be different. Uh, so you can have your own causal graphs and draw similar conclusions. Uh, I'm just using these causal graphs, for example, here. And uh, then how, what you do is you train your classifier and then you make predictions on this training data set, which you call as Y hat. And then you compare Y hat with Y to measure the accuracy of your classifier or also you do it in a similar way to estimate uh, whether you are meeting the equality of opportunity constraints or not. But there is this problem in the training data set that you don't observe actually the full training data, full data set, but you have these past decisions that were, again, I'm assuming were taken based on let's say X and Z. And because of those data uh, past decisions, you observe only partially the variables z, x, and y. So you observe z star, x star, and y star, not z, x, and y. And then now what you can do is you can only uh, make predictions of your classifier on these selected uh, uh, training records. So what you have is y hat star, not y hat, okay? So when we want to estimate EOP constraints from this incomplete data, what we are actually estimating is P of Y hat star given Y hat, Y star and Z star. Okay, and what we actually wanted to estimate was P of Y hat given Y comma Z. Okay, so this by definition, you can write as this. So whenever D is equal to one, that is whenever decisions were positive in the past, uh, you observe the same thing. Whenever D is equal to zero, it's missing, right? So by definition, you can write Y's uh, star variables as 
the original variable given d is equal to one. Now this is not equal to the uh, the metric the constraint that we actually wanted to estimate, which was p of y hat given y comma z. So this was the actual EOP constraint that we wanted to satisfy. What we are estimating is y star given y. Uh, y hat star given z, y star and z star. And why is that? The reason is that if you look at this graph, y hat is not conditionally independent of d uh, given the variables y and z. So this is, uh, there is a technique for reading uh, this conditional independence from a causal graph. It's called the d separation criteria. Again, also proposed by Yuda Perl uh, in 1988. Uh, I have one slide here to explain how this is read from the causal graph, but I'm just going to skip it because it's a bit technical detail. If somebody wants me to explain it, uh, please let me know and I can go through it quickly. So what, what we concluded from this previous slide was that when we have missing data, here, missing data, uh, then the constraints that we are estimating from our data are actually incorrect. So whatever guarantees that we are providing based on evaluating our algorithms on this training data, incomplete training data are not going to hold in practice. And the similar is true if you want to estimate, let's say the demographic parity constraints also. So again, here you want to estimate P of Y hat given Z, but what we are estimating is P of Y hat star given Z star. And then you can show that this is not equal to the quantity that you actually wanted to estimate because again, y hat is not conditionally independent of D given Z. The same criteria, D separation criteria you apply again to make this conclusion from the causal graph. So this was actually shown in a paper uh, by Nathan Kellis and Angela Zhou in 2018, ICML 2018. So what they did was they trained and equal opportunity classifier of uh, this famous paper by Moritz Hartz, uh, equality of opportunity in supervised machine learning. Uh, they trained it on this stop question and frisk data set from New York City. And then they applied the classifier, this fair classifier on the general NYC population. So because it was trained to be fair, the expectation was that it will be fair when applied to the general population. But the observation was that uh, whereas it only 11% of non uh, white non Hispanic innocents were wrongly targeted, up to 20% of white Hispanics and 16% of other, and 15% of black innocents were wrongly targeted in harassment classifier. And this, by the way, was a fair classifier. So, so clearly, uh, missing. If we ignore this missingness issue while training the classifier, the guarantees are not going to hold. This is something that was already shown in a paper, uh, but this causal graph framework that, that I'm discussing actually allows you to, re, to re reach more similar conclusions, general results for, for a wider class of algorithms uh, that do not, let's say, estimate these constraints naively from the training data, but they, for example, require these distributions. So if you read fairness uh, papers, you will often see that they assume that let's say the risk scores are, the true risk scores of the people, of individuals are known. So the risk scores are basically these uh, probability distributions, P of Y given X, P of Y given X, Z. So this is a general assumption while designing fair algorithms that there is, there exists some method by which you can estimate these true uh, distributions from the training data. Now we are going to see whether it's a good assumption or not. Can you actually estimate it from training data when you have missingness in the training data? And if you cannot, then basically whatever algorithm you have designed, again, as I said, its guarantees are not going to hold. So let's first consider the case of fully automated decisions. So when past decisions that cause missingness in the training data were fully automated in the sense they were completely based on observed features. And all these observed features are uh, in your training data set. So D is here is only dependent on X and Z. And the rest of the story is the same that D cause missingness. Uh, in this case, you can show actually that P of Y given X, the distribution 
uh, the risk score can actually be consistently estimated from incomplete data also. Uh, P of Y given X comma Z can also be estimated correctly, but P of X, which is the, the distribution of the features themselves, it, it, that cannot be estimated. And it's actually non-recoverable, which means that there exists no estimator and given no matter how many training data samples you have, you can never recover this true distribution from your training data. So if your algorithm assumes that this distribution is known, uh, keep in mind that you know, this algorithm is not going to work. Uh, then I keep the same graph as I had in this case, but uh, let's say I add one edge between Z and Y. So I assume that the sensitive attribute also has a direct causal impact on the outcome here. Now, in this case, if we see whether P of Y given X, Z can be estimated, then again, the answer is same. P of X, again, the answer is same, but for P of Y given X, the answer changes. So earlier it was easily recoverable, consistently estimated, but now uh, if you naively estimate it, it's going to be a wrong estimate just because I added one edge in the graph. Uh, now let's consider the case of human decisions when past decisions were made by humans and that caused missingness in your training data. So to distinguish it from automated decision-making, I'm going to assume that humans use these unobservable features while making decisions. As I gave examples, let's say what the person was wearing or uh, his hairstyle, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is the same graph as earlier. Now I added this one node U and D, and I'm assuming here that U is uh, this unobserved feature that may have effect on the observed features and may also affect the past decisions of the humans. And that decision finally caused missingness in the training data. So now if we reason about whether P of Y given X, Z can be recovered, yes, it can be easily. P of X, it's, it cannot be recovered again, even in this case. Now uh, let's consider one more example of human decisions. So here, this is the same case as earlier, but now I'm going to change this one edge that was coming from U to X. And now let's make this edge point from U to Y. So an example could be, uh, let's say a human judge, uh, when a defendant comes for hearing, can observe whether the defendant has come with his family or not. Uh, and that uh, feature about the defendant can affect uh, the judge's decision. And it can also affect whether this defendant goes on to commit a crime in two years or not. So just, you know, this feature, whether this person has come with a family or not to the hearing. Uh, so, but this feature may not be recorded in your training data set. So I call it an observed feature. And now the story is the same, the rest of the story that this decision causes missingness in the training data. So P of X, again, it's the same thing, but now here we have a negative result that now if this was the case that uh, humans were using these unobserved features and that unobserved feature had an impact on both the decision and the outcome, then you cannot estimate uh, the risk scores no matter how many samples in the training data you have. Uh, you can also use this com uh, causal graph to model also how much uh, machine aided decisions are made. So uh, here I'm assuming that, so this is the same graph as earlier, but now I added one more uh, node here, DA, which represents the uh, recommendation of the algorithm. So the algorithm also looked at X and Z and came up with a decision DA. The human looked at algorithm's decision, also the features independently, and then came up with a decision D. Okay, and that decision ultimately caused missingness. Okay, so if that, that was the case, then you can show again, things are uh, not as difficult as compared to the previous case. Uh, P of X is non-recoverable, but the risk score at least you can recover. But now if I add that human characteristic of adding, of using the unobserved features, 
again, right? So in addition to looking at the algorithm's input, the human also uses some unobserved feature, then you have a negative result again that you cannot estimate the risk distribution. So this is in general a problem because on, on one hand we say when we talk about regulation, I think I checked the Australian uh, uh, framework, ethic, ethics framework also, they also have this notion about human oversight. They are in, in, in EU framework also, EU commission's framework, they talk about human oversight. GDPR, there is article 22 there that shows, that says that individuals have right not to be not to be subject to com completely automated decision making so a human has to be always involved uh, and if on on one hand uh, so these is, uh, human involvement is something that you know we see as as increasing trustworthiness but on the other hand we have these negative results that show that if humans are involved in decision making then things get so difficult when it comes to actually learning from the data that is being produced. So to summarize, uh, what I discussed till now is that estimating joint distributions of features is impossible in almost all cases of missingness caused by past decisions. Conditional distributions may be recoverable depending on the nature of past decision making and the causal relationship between the variables. Uh, the missingness caused by automated decision making is relatively easier to handle than missingness caused by human decision making or machine aided decision making. And I am not going to give more examples here, but we have more examples in the paper where we show that even small changes in the causal graph where you keep everything same, but just change the direction of the arrow, uh, let's say, the X do not affect, fe uh, features do not affect the outcome, but you assume that the outcome affects the features. So it could be like, uh, if we are talking about test scores as features and uh, Y as you know, a true outcome, whether a candidate is, is qualified or not, then it, that, in that case, you may want to think that, yes, it's the candidate's skills that determine the test scores and not the other way around. So if you just change the, uh, the edge, the direction of the edge in causal graph, then you may have actually very different conclusions about whether the di distributions can be recovered or not. So all these conclusions are very sensitive to actual very precise causal structure of missingness. Now, but uh, we all, so, so far I think I gave mostly negative news that, uh, uh, the distributions are not recoverable, but the, actually, if you look, there were also lots of positive news that some of the distributions are recoverable, especially if the the censoring is fully automated. So, what uh, as an example, we showed that in, in multi-stage decision making, how you can uh, use uh, these results uh, to design an algorithm that is actually fair in the real world, when even when you have uh, missingness in the training data. So consider this two-stage decision-making setting. So in the first stage, decision-making decision maker uses some features, let's say X1, of the individuals, whether to promote them to the next stage or not. And then in the second stage, the decision maker collects additional features, let's say X2, uh, for the individuals who go to the second stage. And then mm, a final decision is made uh, whether uh, about whether the person is let's say hired or not or a loan is given to the uh, that person or not so you can think in university admissions in the first stage it could be test course and then the second stage you may ask for letters of recommendation etc so additional features are being collected in in different stages and the second stage only sees the output of the first stage so people who pass the first stage only for them you ask for recommendation letter. So there is also this missingness that is being caused by the first stage uh, decisions. And then again, by the second stage decisions, you also cause missingness based on two features. So in this case, we can show actually that, so there are three distributions that are of interest. The first one is P of Y given X1 comma X2, the risk score. And you can show that this can be easily recovered from the training data, even if training data has this missingness. 
p of the this joint distribution p of x1 comma x2 as in the earlier cases it's still non recoverable you cannot recover it using any uh, estimator uh, p of y given x1 we show that it's if you do it naively it's incorrect but using a simple factorization technique you can actually recover the correct distribution from the training data so now the question is can we design a fair algorithm that uses only p of y given x1 x2 and p of y given x x1 and not p of x1 comma x2 and if we can do that then how does it compare to the algorithm that actually makes use of all three distributions so we propose this algorithm uh, detail free decentralized and fair algorithm and that solves the following optimization problem at every stage of the selection process so it maximizes the precisions or uh, precision of the decision taken at stage i subject to some budget constraint at stage i so at every stage you want to reduce the number of candidates that go to the next stage so that is your budget uh, so you have some budget constraint at every stage and you have a fairness constraint at every stage so what we show is that you can actually write this objective uh, optimization objective and the constraints using only the recoverable distributions and you can avoid the use of p of uh, the joint distribution uh now we compare this empirically with an algorithm that assumes that somehow uh, p of x1 and x2 is known to the algorithm um and then we see here on three data sets that uh the results are actually very comparable um so on x axis we just have this budget of different uh of the first stage like uh, what fraction of candidates go to the second stage um and then on the y axis you see the utility which is basically the precision of the decisions taken at the final stage so uh i mean the 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 thing the trend to notice here is that Uh, there are two algorithms eaggl which is the oracle algorithm that uses these non recoverable distributions i mean the it somehow assumes that this distribution is uh, correct distribution is given to it and then we have our algorithm the df square algorithm that does not use any non recoverable distribution and as you can see that the utility difference is not significant actually so you can uh, design algorithms uh that will that can avoid the use of these non disc uh, non recoverable distributions and so their guarantees will actually hold in practice uh so to conclude uh, uh the points i made was that first the probability estimates that we use in our supposedly fair algorithms uh, may not be consistent due to data missingness and therefore any fairness guarantee of the training stage does not hold in practice and depending on the causal mechanism of data missingness and applications uh, we can sometimes design algorithms to be fair uh, even if trained with incomplete data and we can probably do that uh, without compromising the utility of the algorithm and the final i guess which was very interesting point for me was that the human involvement in in decision making uh, presents challenging research questions uh, from data censoring and missingness perspective i mean we always know that you know humans make things complicated but uh, from from fairness from the censoring and missingness perspective also at least we have this uh, formal result now that it does make things hard so that's it from my, from my side i'll take any questions thank you